Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to week 147. And yeah, we're going to go deep. And Adam's going to pull back the cover and pull back the curtain on what bankers are looking for from you, especially as you guys are thinking about, hey, um, we may be needing to increase our line of credit, or I want a better um, rate on my loan or whatever. So he's going to go deep and wide on that. Um, this is the only piece of branded merchandise I have from working at Bank of America or First Union. So uh, this is not a political statement about Bank of America as far as affinities or anything. This is just the only banking thing I had, and I don't wear it because I don't want somebody hitting me on my bike. <laughs> so anyway, Adam, um, as we're ramping up, I'll just remind everybody, hit the Q&A if you've got questions along the way. We're ready to go uh, you know, as deep as you guys want to on that. You can harass us on the chat. Hopefully Papa Joe's on, and I think the chat is enabled. I also have two polling questions when Adam's ready to go on what you like most about your bank and what you like least about your bank. I think that would be a very interesting thing to just see what the survey says and see where the, the graphs take us. But Adam, we also had some things uh, from the State of the Union. Uh, you know, there were some trial balloons, no pun intended, uh, floated on some potential tax changes. And, you know, whether they get through Congress, that's another story. But I don't know if you want to talk about any of that stuff or, you you know, you've got the mic now. Yeah, I'm going to so hit my um, my tirade and I will apologize in advance. <laughs> start to lose um, loyal listeners or otherwise somebody needs to fix something. Um, keeping in mind that I'm a libertarian, not a liberal. Um, so. I'll come back to the State of the Union in a second, but if you just go to, you know, yes, I think it was. Um, the city of Charlotte voted to accept a proposal to do a feasibility study that that was suggested by Metro the toll aids on I-77 that I'm a prolific user of um, as a way of funding widening of I-77 um, from Uptown to uh, Rock Hill. So, you know, a lot of people were like, this is BS, you know, how dare they, you know, consider a toll lane, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's just not fair. We should get more money in Charlotte. We're really big, you know, all that. But, you know, it's the same stuff I heard, you know, up north, um, when they were talking about the toll roads uh, up north. And, you know, the, the comment that now Senator Tilla said, you know, when he was the Speaker of the House at the time that that passed in North Carolina was that like, the only way they're getting built is if they get built this way. So, you know, what the DT has said in the state of North Carolina is that roads will not be wide on I-77 like until 2040. So unless you do this, you don't have, you know, too much, too much of a choice. Um, Gary Judge said, I'm breaking up. Are you hearing the same thing? Yeah, you're breaking up. All right. Um, let me go to my speaker just to see if that's uh, just my heads up. headphones. Hold on a second. All right. Stay tuned. I wish I had some, you know, Muzak, but we didn't pay the subscription, so I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's a little bit better now. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so skull candy earbuds put away. Anyway, so the, you know, people were just aghast. And, you know, and oh my gosh, you know, why we pay taxes, you know, why can't we get our roads widened? Right? And the Department of Transportation is like, hey, you can get your roads widened in 2040, <laughs> you know, which is just that's a long time. So, you know, at the same time, we want what we're talking like the, the North Carolina General Assembly is focused on reducing taxes. And it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, 
well, we also need to, you know, if we didn't spend so much money, you know, wasted everywhere, then maybe we'd have money to pay for this other stuff. It's like, where are you going to cut? <laughs> you know, that, that's that's going to that's going to get to that that point. So I think I think my tirade, generally, Gary, is that you know the same thing that exists in Charlotte that exists on the road debate in terms of well, I want to have it I want to have it my way, which would be I, I have the lowest tax rate possible um and at the same time i've cut all necessary I've, I've cut all government spending that is considered you know crazy um and at the same time i'm going to give you everything you want like your wider roads that's just not a real condition i don't think that that exists in the real world so the same thing happened in the state of New York when you saw the back and forth about social security medicare cuts and you know, all that kind of stuff is it's just it's not a credible argument to say that you can make um, you can you can somehow curb deficit spending, cut benefits and lower taxes at the same time like that. That's just not math. <laughs> this is the real world. And it's just it's just a kind of. Hey folks, please don't buy into that. That's possible, you know, because no one's produced a proposal that act that actually could produce that um, solution unless they do the old. Uh, hey, we're going to grow the economy at a greater rate than it's grown, you know, kind of ever <laughs> uh, before um, argument to try to to try to fix it. So it's just not it's not one of the it's just not one of those things. So yeah. Just, you know, so I, I just feel like I, I am, I am, you know, in general, from the state of the union, you know, I am generally concerned that, yes, we've done a lot of stuff and there has not been, it, nobody's produced a really good way to pay for it all. Um, so I, I just believe that, you know, I don't know how, you know, I, I think the way they're going to do it is they're just going to let the, the Trump tax cuts expire, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I think they're going to let them expire. Nobody's going to say anything about it. Nobody's going to bow you. Oh my God, this is the worst thing that ever happened. You know, and then you know we'll go on. We'll go on about about our day because it's you know I don't. Otherwise, I don't see how we're going to pay for all this stuff. So, anywho, that's my opening well, tirade, Gary. Sorry, I, I like it. No, I, I like it. And you know, it's, like, it's like you know, sorry to finish the tirade. It's like again, remember I'm a little scary and I don't. But you know, but instead, what we'll do is we'll talk about what absolutely cannot be taught in public schools. <laughs> you know, like, I don't care where everybody sits on that. I've got my own feelings where people sit on that. What I get upset about is like, really, we're talking about that instead of like real basic stuff that will have an economic impact, <laughs> you know, on us. <laughs> so, anywho, I'll get off my soapbox now. <clears throat> So Papa Joe has weighed in on this, and I I actually agree with you, Joe. Uh, he says, I think the concern is that Biden's already pushed an infrastructure bill through and we should get our fair share. And sure makes sense. And <laughs> we're not a port and we don't have ESG uh, as a guideline uh, guideline to get any port money, um, you know, thanks to pay Mayor, Mayor Pete. But, you know, that's a whole nother thing. But the, the reality is, Charlotte is not the seat of power for the state, and yet Raleigh is. And Charlotte usually becomes kind of the second, you know, stepsister for some reason. It seems that way. I don't know. I'm not a governmental guy, and I really don't want to be. Um, so, you know, I think you raise a good point, Joe. And what do we do about it? I, I don't know. Um, you know, talk to our representatives. I, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's so frustrating. And I think so. I hear what you're saying, Adam, about what's being taught in schools. Well, there's some crazy crap being taught in schools. I mean, like I there's some crazy stuff. And it's I think people we're seeing just this deep divide and polarization, which just is so sad to me because this is a great country. And this is why we like you guys as as business owners, because you are the M engine. You are the economic engine that is is keeping this thing going and you're the ones that are risk the risk takers you know you put your money where your mouth is that's why we like serving you um 
So speaking yeah, of money, I, go ahead. I was say, my only point with that, Gary, was that, and now I swear I'll shut up, is that I remember <laughs> my good friend Bill Russell, who heads the Lake Norman Chamber, when I talked about the same issue, was that, well, you know, people can't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. It's like I've not seen a single politician that can walk, they can uh, walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. So it just it just feels like, hey, instead of dealing with the hard problems, we're going to deal with the layups. <laughs> you know? It's like, well, there you go. Those- problems <laughs> you actually raise an interesting point because they're in like perpetual fundraising mode all the time all the time well and so you know throw some red meat to your base go for the low-hanging fruit where it doesn't require a lot of uh time and effort <laughs> You know, right. I don't know, man. And both sides are guilty of it. Let's just call a spade a spade, you know. That's why I said I'm just reminding everybody that I'm a libertarian. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You're 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 a little bit more on the liberal side of the libertarian. I'm on a little more on the conservative side, and we kind of balance each other out. I like that. Um, so here is a poll that I want to get uh, everybody fired up about. And let's see where this is before we got, before we go into Adam's presentation and it's interactive, but he's got some John Madden uh, plays going on there. So it's pretty cool. All right. So I'm going to launch this, uh, this poll. Hopefully you guys can, you guys can see it pulling back the curtain on banking. The first question What do you like most about your bank? My commercial banker. We have some commercial bankers on here too, by the way. Convenience, right mix of service, history with them, responsiveness, easy to do business, and low fees. (laughs) Everybody likes those low fees. I'm just curious. Come on. Let's see. what. Oh, we got some. I like my commercial banker. I like that. Hopefully, it it better be the commercial bankers on here that are (laughs) voting for that. Uh, come on. We got five people that have voted out of 25. Come on. Keep voting. All right. Next question is, what do I like least? Oh, boy. Yeah, that that <laughs> that gets things moving. Oh, my commercial uh, lender. Uh, lack of convenience. Fees are too high. Lack of responsiveness. <clears throat> Hard to do business with. A little bit of that. All right. You guys are voting away here. All right. I think it's interesting. So about half of you guys, a little over half of you have voted. If you haven't and you have the ability or and you're not driving in the toll lanes on 77, <laughs> uh, vote. But at, with 15, the easy to do business with is the number one reason that you like your banks. And the commercial banker is the number two. It is about relationships. What do you like least about your bank? Well, the good news is is the commercial banker wasn't the number one issue. Number one issue is fees are too high. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Uh, lack of convenience is one. And then also in high up there is lack of responsiveness. So I'm going to go ahead and share the results with you guys. If you guys can see that. Kind of interesting. Um, real quick story, and then we'll get into John Madden's yeah, place. Go ahead. It's actually really funny that the right mix of services is the lowest polling result um, because you know you know it's going to be great. We got this. We got this. We got this. It's like nobody cares. <laughs> you, know, you know they they care about other stuff. You know, which is the oh. relationship in this way. So I, just, I find that interesting as a poll result. Yeah, I, I agree. And Joe weighs in on this. This is a very true phenomenon, especially in this in this city. Lots of churn with commercial bankers. <clears throat> that is a true statement. So here's a quick story, and then we'll go into Adam's um, John Madden plays, which I think are, is so good. So Bank of America, when it was Nations Bank, they hired me to be a MacGyver. That's why MacGyver is on my title. And they said, hey, 
this acquisition in the Midwest, 11 state region, it was called Boatman's, um, not Boatsman, but Boatman's bank shares. And um, that acquisition was kind of upside down. Their, a lot of their metrics were upside down. They were a, a acquisition machine on the East Coast and it was not working in the Midwest. I was from the Midwest. They thought it was a, com a, a communication issue. And so they said, all communication internally and externally is going through you. And I'm like, through me? And they go, we got an army of people. We need you to go figure out what the deal is. So I did. And I went and met with all people all over the place from, you know, Amarillo, Texas to St. Louis to all kinds of places, everybody kind of in the entire spectrum. And I came back and I said, well, here's the deal. Yes, it's a communication issue. We're going out and we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars saying the sign of more good things to come and with a big new Nations Bank logo. But what that means is, and this was from everybody, you just jacked up my fees. Fees are too high. Whoo, interesting. You dropped my rate of return. Bob, the business banker that I love and adore, has just been emasculated because all the loan decision making authority got shipped to Charlotte. And Susie, the teller that we've loved for the last 20 years, uh, is afraid she's going to lose her job. And they're like, keep your good things. That's what that meant. I thought that was very interesting. And the issue was, yeah, so that we had a communication issue, but the bigger issue was culture. People in the Midwest that we had acquired did not realize how unique and, and empowering our, our culture was at the time. So I just thought it was... Um, a very interesting thing to see this tied with my very vivid experience um, at Nations Bank and then Bank of America with that one deal. But And Churn, that was one of the things. Um, Joe, you raised this issue. We had our best commercial bankers getting picked off in the panhandle of Texas because the commercial bankers, our best ones, were being given Ford F-150s, not the Lightnings, Adam, but they didn't have those yet. But the Ford F-150s as signing bonuses. Well, guess what? They like their pickups in the panhandle. <laughs> so just an interesting thing. So uh, let's see. Uh, Q&A. Before we left B of A, our loan officer was based in Tampa. When we asked if we would meet in person, we got a definitive no. Oh, yeah, kind of says it all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing like showing you the love there, Joe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you couldn't pay me enough to go back into the big banks right now. Um, I like it at bank at, at uh, BGW, and uh, I enjoyed my time at Bank of America, but I'm really glad to be here. So, Adam, you ready for me to do screen share? Yeah, if you don't mind, and I'll uh, just give you the signal when we need to advance the slide. Groovy, you just let me know. All right, awesome. So we had, you know, if you want to go ahead and hit start on the presentation so we can hit this first slide. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I got to get that out of the way. There we go. There we go. All right. Yeah. So we had a lot of questions around, you know, hey, do you think I can get some more debt from the bank? You know, or do you think I can get credit limit increase? I mean, who are you guys talking that I should try to get more credit? You know, while it's still out there and available, you know, da, da, da. and then, you know, at some point they get turned down by their bank. And, you know, going back to the commercial relationship, um, my relationship with the commercial lender, you know, that's a, it that's a hard job because it's not like that person is always the person that's saying no, <laughs> you know, it's somebody else saying no. And sometimes that no decision is something that the credit or that the commercial lender knew was going to be a no, but got your hopes up anyway. <laughs> and other times it's a commercial lender thought it should be a yes. And then for whatever reason, you know, the big heads and the start and the planetary alignment just didn't work out in the back office and they didn't get, a, they didn't get the memo that the, that the, that the goal changed. <laughs> um, and now you were no longer credit worthy. So 
what I thought I would do with this one, since we did have some um, survey questions that says, hey, can you talk about kind of banking relationships and credit and, and loans, just to go through, you know, look, here's based on, you know, our experience, what we see as, all right, if you generally meet these factors, you're going to get your loan approved all day long. And if you didn't, then your bank sucks and we'll find you a bank that will approve your, your loan all day long. However, if you don't meet these attributes, but your commercial lender is saying, no, 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 we can do it anyway, then you know, you're kind of dealing with somebody who is a people pleaser. Like they just don't want to say no, so they're gonna let the credit card be the bad guy. <laughs> you know, and in reality, they probably should have said no or should have said, hey. I'd love to give you the money, but you're going to need to do this for me first, which is what the best commercial lenders are going to do. So, you know, generally speaking, if you just go into, you know, when will a bank lend you money? I mean, if you start off with, if you're not even meet, meeting these attributes, it's going to be tough, you know, which is basically, you know, sales are on an increasing trend and your bottom line is on an increasing trend. You know, that, that's a no brainer. Banks love that scenario. That's why it's got the happy face. Now, a lot of people would, would generally say, well, if that's the case, why do I need the bank? <laughs> well, the reason for that is that anybody that's experienced relatively high growth, unless you have a massive freaking savings account, it's really hard to high finance a high growth thing. So banks are typically loaning on growing companies with a growing bottom line. Because those companies' balance sheets are growing. It's just not in things that banks like, like receivables and inventory, because those generally increase as your sales increase. So from the bank's perspective, it's like they love that scenario because they recognize that you're bumping up against a liquidity issue because you're about to outrun your, you're about to outgrow your cash. You know, that's a good problem to have. Outgrow cash, good problem to have. You know, generally that means that things are going to be pretty rosy on the backside. So what they're really loaning you at that point is they're loaning you some temporary growth capital that you should be able to repay back as soon as your balance sheet becomes more liquid. So from that perspective, it's like, they love that situation all day long. And if you're scratching your head saying, well, of course, you know, but why do I need the bank? You know, just remember the bank's cost of capital is relatively cheap, you know? So if I have to, borrow some money to maybe hire one or two more people or buy some additional inventory that I might not have otherwise, you know, bought if I had to do it by myself, then that's a good, that's a good use of money. You know, I'm generating a greater return on that money than I am, you know, on the interest that I'm paying the bank. So that, that's a good scenario. Um, second scenario where sales are flat, but net incomes up, that that's, that's just as good, you know, happy face on that because you know what, you're showing some fiscal responsibility in terms of getting your cost structure in line. So the bank loves that all day long too. Um, so when you start getting into the, eh, I don't know, or the, <laughs> you know, that's going to be a real problem zone. It's when sales are up. But the bottom line is neutral or potentially declining. You know, that one is one of those gonna need an explanation. Like, is this like a permanent problem or was this just a temporary problem with some one time items? And if I add it back, I actually would have been in one of the two conditions that exist above. So if your condition is, you know, sales are up, but the bottom line isn't improving. You know, the bank's going to look at that as like, yeah, this, you know, this guy's working harder for less money. You know, is that is that is that is that situation just going to continue to where you know sales are up and and I basically sold my way to bankruptcy? <laughs> you know, because I've cut margins so much, you know, to generate the sale and I'm not actually generating any more cash flow. So that's a you know that's a could go both ways. You know, scenario depending on the bank and your relationship. Um, sales down, that income down, man, that's a no-go. And, and that really sucks to say because, you know, a lot of people will be like, but that's when I need the money the most, <laughs> you know, it's when my sales are down and my bottom line's down. In that scenario, that's kind of a, be happy that you're getting renewed and start making some hard decisions. In other words, 
Um, this is sort of the scenario of the US. <laughs> and if we we're acting as business owners, we would be making hard decisions to be fiscally responsible because the bank's not going to loan us any more money. Um, that, that's what this scenario uh, represents. So you just got to, you know, it's, it's a tough one, you know, that, that you, you know, you just, you're, you're probably not going to have any success. And if this is your scenario and your commercial bank, you're saying, no, no, we can do that loan all day long. I don't know, man. I mean, that, that, that's another one where, you know, maybe you're just dealing with people pleaser and the ultimate answer is going to be a no, and they're just going to blame somebody else. Um, so you want to go ahead and advance the next slide, Gary? Yep. Hold on. Oh. All right. So the next thing you need to look for, this is where it starts to get a little bit wonky. So once you pass the first screen, it's like, okay, I'm in the happy face zone. Yay. What else matters? You know, what else matters is that, you know, you have a strong enough balance sheet, which is really what, like, you'll hear people call this different things, debt to equity, tangible net worth, you know, whatever, you know, the case may be. But, you know, basically, um, that's going to be your assets. If you have significant fixed assets, you would put fixed assets in here, too. Um, but that's basically going to be your assets that you can reach out and touch relative to your debt. And what they want to see is that you just have more assets than debt, you know? So if you look at like, you know, that, that, that's considered having a book, a positive book value in the company. And the reason for that, and especially why that wants want that to be a little bit more on the liquid side of the assets, meaning accounts receivable and inventory is because they want to know that, look, if, if the company, things are looking great now, but if the company does have, a little bit of a blip, then they're going to be able to sustain themselves, you know, versus becoming insolvent. So, you know, what's a pretty good ratio for that? You know, it's one and a half times um, that, you know, basically one and a half times the stuff on the left, which is the numerator, versus the stuff that's on the right, which is the denominator. Now, what does that mean if you don't hit this ratio or you're right at the ratio? It means that if you've been taking some pretty fat distributions out of the company, which is which is a, which is a depleter of cash, you know, which is part of this equation, it could be that those are just going to be limited, you know, at some point in the future. So we get we get a lot of people that'll you know say, oh, man, you know, my banker's being a jerk, you know, they're imposing all these covenants on us, you know, I don't want any covenants. Well, this is like a fiscally responsible com covenant. This is this is to prevent you from being a dumbass and doing something stupid. It's here for your own good. It just represents, you know, good financial stewardship. So don't get mad, you know, just kind of do the right thing. And what, what most bankers will tell you is like, look, you know, they all lived through the Great Recession, you know, and they weren't looking at stuff like this as hard during the Great Recession, which is why they went down. And a lot of banks went down in flames. So the reason that this kind of thing exists is because they don't want to have it happen again. The only way that they're going to, they, they don't want to have it happen again is they have to force some fiscal responsibility. This is one of those items. So a lot of times when you're like, yeah, man, I don't want any covenants, that's blah, blah. What the banker is going to tell you is I can't negotiate the covenant, but I could give you a little bit better fee. <laughs> you know, maybe a little bit better interest rate, you know, to, to soften whatever pain you're feeling. But at the end of the day, you know, love you guys. But if you're complaining about this, you kind of just be in a baby. You know, this just is good old fashioned basic fiscal responsibility uh, here. So, you know, go ahead and switch slides, Gary. Yeah. And before I do, uh, a, couple, a few comments have come in. So one of our commercial bankers on here, Andrew Krasinski with Fifth Third Bank, uh, he says balance sheet is critical. Great commentary. And he also says, especially with the tumultuous economy, banks are highly focused on balance sheet strength for weathering economic downturns. And Joe says lenders tend to undervalue your undervalue your inventory regardless of turns. You want to speak to that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, basically, they're going to look at like 
it, I, it's not, it's not so much that they'll undervalue your inventory, you know, as part of their calculation, they may have, you know, Hey, we'll only loan you so much on your inventory. And they're basically going to say, you know, something like 75% of the current value, which is going to be anything that's, you know, less than six months old or less than, less than a year old. So, you know, even, even if your terms have been consistent, if they're not fast, there, there, there is going to be some discounting in the banker's head. And so Andrew uh, confirmed <laughs> Joe's suspicion and comment said typically 50% of inventory and less customer pays for an external audit. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. So the next covenant that you pretty that you see, you know, it's it's called a lot of things, you know, cash flow coverage, debt coverage, fixed charge, covenant, whatever. Basically, what it is 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 the company generating enough income to meet its obligations through its operating income. So that's that's generically EBITDA divided by how much you got to have going out in terms of debt. Because if you think about it, it so to keep it real simple, if I made $100 and my debt payments were $100, that means that every dime that I'm taking in, I'm spinning out to pay debt. Um, Gary, out of curiosity, when we're talking about a budget deficit at the U.S. level, what does that actually mean? It means that I'm taking in less than I'm spending, spending more. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, you know, if, if, if you, if so th this, this would be a negative ratio if you actually said, well, let's say that the United States is the customer. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's a negative ratio. So you kind of see why this whole thing is a problem. <laughs> yeah. So it um so you may, and it, is it okay to be negative, you know, occasionally? Yeah, that's fine. But negative is a strategy, you know, probably not good. So the debt coverage, you know, kind of the minimum ratio the banks are looking at is 1.25. However, I've I've modified this a bit for our purposes to go back to hey guys, don't be babies. You know, even it is what it is, you know. Uh, earnings before income tax, interest taxes, depreciation, amortization, um, divided by debt payments and distributions. So I added in the distributions in there, which aren't always included in your covenant calculations. And I'm going to explain that, I believe, on the next slide. But basically, if you think about it, you know, if I'm if I'm Gary, you know, and it takes Gary two hundred grand to live, right? And Gary's been, you know, a good client of BGW. He's listened to all our prior webinars. He set up his nest corporation. He's like, hey, Adam, I'm totally taking your advice. You know, I make I'm, I, I have two hundred thousand on a lifestyle. You know, how do I optimize my tax rate? Well, Adam is going to tell Gary, look, Gary, way you optimize your tax rate. You know, got to take a wage. So let's have that be, you know, anywhere between fifty and hundred thousand dollars of wage. Take the rest out in distributions. You know, so Gary says, "You got it, boss man. That's exactly what I'm going to do." Gary still needs to. Gary still spending the same two hundred grand, right? It's just that. Keep it simple. Hundreds coming into W two. That's arriving at net income. Then I've got the net income of hundred grand. Well. If I had a little bit of a down year and I only made a hundred grand, I've got a problem and I have a hundred thousand dollars in debt, I've got a problem, don't I? <laughs> because I need not only my debt of a hundred grand that I need to, to earn to be able to pay off, I also need the hundred grand to keep Jennifer from yelling at me. <laughs> you know, so I technically needed 200 grand, but I only generated a hundred grand. <laughs> That's a, that's a problem. So that's why I feel like, again, to be fiscally responsible, you know, you really need to add distributions into the calculation um, just to just to make sure you're safe. Um, you know, I think this this is like one of those categories where, you know, when business owners are, you know, you know, my deal, Gary, it's like I put the head down. Ah, past my promise. Ah, everything's still OK. Ah, past my like because your 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 banker was a nice guy, did you just solid? Didn't include distributions in the calculation. Like you're not helping yourself. You know, this, this is one of those things that's meant to 
help you to be more financially um, responsible as a business owner. So you're gonna go ahead and uh, switch slides, Gary. All right, so lecture, lecture done, almost done. So next question we oftentimes get is how much debt can I, can I, can I afford to take on? You know, in this scenario, so I just wanted to give an example of how I would calculate that in terms of am I generating enough operating cash to take on some more debt? So in this example, I've got company makes $200,000, you know, I've got $100,000 in distributions um, and, and debt service that I'm taking. So basically $200,000 times 1.25 says that I can afford 160 grand going out of the company, right? So even though I've only got a hundred grand going out of the company right now, I can afford $160,000 to go out of the company. So assuming that I have a $60,000 Delta and I'm like, well, how much more debt can I afford? And assuming that the hundred grand is meeting my needs at home and meeting my debt service, you know, I don't need anything more there. A hundred grand is what it is then that $60,000, you know, keep it real simple. I multiply it times four, because let's assume that, no, you know, no bank's going to give you, you know, better than a five-year amortization period unless you're with the SB, SBA back. I use four just as basic ghetto math to, you know, hey, let's not forget, you know, let's not do a proper amortization schedule, you know, blah, blah. You know, it's not going to be zero interest. So using four years is good, you know, almost right. A little bit on the conservative side. What that really means is that you can afford to take on between 240 and probably $300,000 of additional debt. So the question that you're going to ask, your debt, that's going to have a cost associated with it, obviously. You know, so your question is, what can I actually make with this additional debt? So you're using the bank's money, 240 grand. What are you going to invest in that? that's gonna give you a better return than your interest rate. You know, so if you think about like, I don't know, I mean, what if I hired another sales guy, right? So sales guy is gonna cost me, you know, 200 grand, but if that sales guy can generate a million dollars in new business and that million dollars doesn't require any more overhead and I've got a 50% gross profit. So it generates $500,000 in gross profit, you know, had to pay the sales guy 200 grand. I got 300 grand that just flowed to the bottom line all for the low, low cost of maybe $12,000 in interest payments. That's a, that, that's what Gary, a good deal. You know, I should not, I should not. Two thumbs up. Yeah. So that, that, that is a wise use of credit is when you, when you have, you know, if you think about it, bankers always talk about sources and uses, sources and uses. You know, in this scenario, it's like, if I had a business plan where I could make some strategic investments in my business, use the debt to do it, and I was pretty confident those investments, those investments are gonna pay off, why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't I do that, you know, all day long, assuming that I was able to meet the other ratios that we talked about in this, in this, uh, presentation because I can, I, what, what it's showing is that my balance sheet and my operating income can't afford it. Regardless of how I feel about like, oh my God, I just don't like debt. Well, look at what you're giving up. I mean, in that case, you're giving up 300 grand a year, you know, a million and a half to $2 million in value creation, all because I wasn't willing to take on any risk at all, <laughs> you know, of increasing my debt level. That, you know, at some point you gotta say, hey, is that really the best decision? So anyway, I believe that was my last slide. Uh, is that correct, Gary? Yep, got it. Correct. That concludes our presentation. And I hope that helps um, everybody demystify a little bit you know, how that is, that isn't everything that goes, you know, obviously your credit scores 500, you had a bankruptcy, you know, other factors that that's going to come into play. But if you think about like, what's the, what's the 20% of the things that they look at, that's going to get you 80% of your answer. It's, it's that presentation, you know, right there. That if you, if you do, if you do the stuff that's on that presentation, real good chance, you're going to be approved. Um,
if, if you're not, then it's, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not even 50, 50, you know, probably. And again, when people ask me how much more debt that can I take on that, that's the equation that I would use to tell you what can you afford. You know, it's funny because we're very familiar with this term when it comes to our house, you know, how much house can I afford? It's pretty simple. You know, it's basically how much do I make versus how much am I willing to allocate to house payments? You know, it's just a ratio of income to house payments. Same concept applies to a business. Ratio of bottom line income to debt payments and distributions. Yeah, that's good. So I'm curious. I know Andrew's on. <clears throat> I didn't know if it, uh, I didn't recognize any other commercial bankers. If if there are, let me know. Any thoughts from you guys as far as anybody that that is a banker? Um, oh yeah, this is good. So Andrew did weigh in on this. Uh, your banker should provide the client the ratios utilized for analyzing credit worthiness. Yeah, that's right. Because they're not, that, that's a good point. Because they're, they're not always right. Because what ends up happening is that, you know, you sit in your financials, you don't think anything about it. You know, here you go. And then they're taking them, giving them to somebody else to do all these calculations. You know, A, there could be just a, a basic data entry error that could happen. B, they could have they could have used stuff that wasn't relevant, you know, or wasn't, you know, needed for the purpose of the calculation or was just, you know, kind of wrong interpretation of your financial statement. So kind of highlights the whole thing about watch what you send to, <laughs> you know, to make sure that it's right. You, you know, it's funny. I think we have heard, I know I've heard this and I, Adam, I'm sure you've heard this many times like, yeah, I'll never do business with that bank again because they turned me down. <clears throat> well, many times, not always, but many times that the person that's usually the business owner that says that did not understand why. All they knew is they, they didn't, they turned me down. Or the other thing that I've heard is, yeah, they strung me along. And then I find out, oh, well, they're not lending into my industry they've stepped you know cut things back and it goes back to a comment that adam had early on which is if you've got a real people pleaser commercial banker that's wanting to say yes and you know you them you know they wanting you to like them <laughs> um well they're not doing you or themselves a favor by stringing you along because it just adds to the frustration <laughs> uh Good question from Joe. If the best investments that you've made would be housing, does it make sense to buy more house than you're technically qualified for? Um, so that, I mean, I feel like if you feel that you will generally have an income. So I, I would not bet if I was betting on the house appreciating in value. Because, you know, it's just your life's going to get tough. You can't afford to have anything bad happen. Yeah. If, if, on the other hand, you um, believe that, look, I mean, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to make more next year than I'm going to make this year. Kind of just a temporary analysis, right? So I, I would go right to the line, you know, on that. Level. Any other questions out there from you guys? Um, this was really good. And I, I will just put another plug in. If you are a BGW client, and you're a business client, and you've got access to the vault, if you don't, let us know, and we'll make sure that you do. But if you are a BGW client, there are a whole series of uh, videos in there on the Tax Academy, there's a Cash Flow Academy, etc., that 
address some of these things that we've talked about and then some there's i mean it's really rich with great content and you know what's the number one thing that uh, probably people want to look at and the number one question you get adam about owner owner fringe <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> owner fringe benefits that's got our best thinking and a lot of its atoms uh but also guys like john and tanya and richard that have weighed in on that so um anyway that that is a huge resource that you you do well to tap that any other questions or thoughts from you guys uh sorry that we don't have jack on here this week and he he asked for us to be kind to him and not bash him <laughs> yeah but you know so it's not the same without his bad dad jokes or some of his co commentary uh he will not be back next week either um i think what we're going to try to do if he can make this happen no guarantees but um his tax attorney has who has been on with us a, a couple times before the confessions of a former irs agent that is always a good one <laughs> so if anybody's ever listened to those uh those are good um he's got some great war stories and adam does too uh, because he has been beside clients and fortunately we've done really well with those guys and <laughs> yeah i think that's right joe he is out of gift cards he is having to go back and restock or i think he's having to you know fly up to meet with the CEO and say, what's what's up with all these expenses on Starbucks gift cards? I don't know. So <laughs> we'll see. We will put this thing up on the BGW YouTube channel later on this afternoon. Any last call for any questions? You got, you know, you got Adam Boatsman on here. Stump the chump on anything that you've got, especially we're in the thick of tax season right now. So if you got anything, Hit us up or be with us next week for week 148. Also, final question for you guys. Think about this. March the 17th was our first weekly webinar in 2020. So our three-year anniversary, we did our 100th week anniversary last year, but our three-year anniversary of doing these things is coming up. So it'd be kind of fun to hear from you guys what we should talk about on that <clears throat> so think about that join us next week thank you adam you you always do a great job all right i like Thanks, your rants as well um anyway thank you and thank you andrew for weighing in on this things thank you also papa joe you always we can always count on you guys yep. have a great rest of the week enjoy the weather out there all right Bye -bye. see you guys